I'd just like to say, say welcome to everybody who is here with us. Uh, we're so excited to have you here. Uh, today we're meeting for a Multiply Vineyard webinar in partnership with Vineyard Worship. And our focus is going to be on raising up and training worship leaders for your church plan. And we have a ton to cover. We're probably going to go about 60 minutes as far as content. Uh, and then we're going to leave plenty of time at the end and kind of in the middle for discussion and Q&A, um, all that kind of stuff. So uh, please be engaged with us along the way. Just a couple notes on our software. We're using Zoom. Uh, you have a couple buttons in your top left there, like to raise your hand or to uh, open up your chat window. Uh, people are commenting right now. We see John Barnett joined us uh, and people are saying hello, catching up with folks in the room. Uh, feel free to open up your chat window so you can contact us, so you can say hi, uh, so you can ask us questions along the way. And what we want to do right off the bat uh, is kind of continue that piece of staying connected and hearing from you. So we want to know who's in the room. I'm going to launch a poll here. And uh, you should on your screen now see two questions. The first one is, what is your role in ministry? Uh, multiple choice. Have a few different choices there, worship leader, church planter, pastor, ministry leader, or other. Uh, and that one, you can click too. If you fall into multiple categories there, feel free to click a couple. Uh, and then we want to know is, are you coming from a vineyard background? Uh, we, we know that a lot of folks around the vineyard are kind of welcomed into this conversation, and we have some folks who, uh, who aren't. So feel free to click, click those for a few minutes. Um, we'll comment on it in a second, but I want to introduce uh, the folks in the room right now. So. We have, uh, we have four tremendous panelists. Uh, in addition to me, I'm Justin Junton, and I'm just running the show, making sure we stay on time. And I'm here in Duluth, Minnesota with the Multiply team. Uh, also in the room, we have Michael Gatlin, uh, senior pastor at the Duluth Vineyard, uh, national coordinator for Multiply Vineyard, and longtime worship leader uh, in lots of different church plants, and uh, even here at the Duluth Vineyard, still playing drums. Uh, Michael, hello. How are you? And... Uh, or when's the next time you're playing drums here? Uh, I think in a couple of weeks I'm playing again. They let the old guy get up there and try to keep up. I, I know every beat you could possibly know from the 70s. So sometimes those actually fit in songs. In addition to all the Van Morrison beats, he's, he's repping his Van Morrison t-shirt today. Uh, yes. Also in the room, we have Jason Hagen. Uh, Jason Hagen uh, is the general manager of Vineyard Worship, uh, as evidenced by those those fancy records on the back wall. Uh, he's at Vineyard Fullerton in Southern California and uh, one of the best wine tasters I know in the vineyard. Uh, Jason, good to have you with us. Say hi to everybody here today. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, also in Southern California, we have Melissa Keller. Melissa works with Vineyard Worship as well. Uh, she does everything regarding all of our uh, worship leader retreats. You've, uh, if you're a worship leader in the vineyard, you, you likely know uh, Melissa and uh, has just done a ton with worship along the way. She's also uh, at the Vineyard Fullerton in Southern California. Hi, Melissa. How are you doing? I am very good. Thank you. Thanks for having me and good to see everyone <laughs> and be here with you. And uh, Tracy just says, thank you, Melissa. Tracy, there, you have folks commenting to you already. I love it. Uh, and all the way on the other coast, we have Ted Kim, uh, worship pastor at the Vineyard Church in Syracuse, New York. Uh, he oversees everything worship there uh, and then has done a lot with our regional worship leader retreats, especially on the East Coast. Uh, and Ted, you are a diehard, diehard Cubs fan. Am I correct? I am. Uh, they ha they're having an okay year, huh? No, this is the year, guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. This is it. This is the year. <laughs> Please. And uh, Matt Grecu says, way to represent the East Side, brother. So we have a few folks uh, saying hi to you, Ted, there along the way. Um, well, folks, we're so, so excited to have you here. Um, Michael, uh, before we get going, we're just going to end this poll and share the results with everybody. We have uh, predominantly, most of the folks in the room are worship leaders. And we have some church planters, we have some pastors, a few ministry leaders, uh, and most of our folks are, are in the vineyard. Uh, just a couple of folks who uh, aren't currently or actively involved in the vineyard church. Welcome to you folks who are here that um, will be kind of joining in for a little bit of a, uh, an inside language family conversation on how we do worship, but we love your voices here as well. So Michael, seeing kind of those, any, any comments or welcomes to the folks we have in the room? 
Yeah, I'm excited that we have some uh, church planners in the room, and and uh, looks like we got a good good mix of uh, everybody in terms of ministry roles. So this will be great. Awesome. So Michael, why don't you just talk to us a little bit as we get going about we want to we want to really dive into the essential characteristics for identifying developing worship leaders. What have you seen over the years for those core essentials that we need to have? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think to start out with, worship is really about kind of orienting our lives around God. And so the most important characteristic, kind of the strongest thing that has to be there is that deep, intimate uh, relationship with God ourselves. You know, what was the old vineyard line that we've heard over the years, you you can't serve what you ain't cooking. And uh like you can't take people to where you haven't been. And so like, I'd love to hear, you know, Melissa, Ted and Jason, but that's like the first thing that, that I would throw out as a really big, important thing. We have to be, uh, in order to really lead others anywhere, we have to be experiencing it ourselves. And so a really deep, passionate uh, relationship with Jesus. For me personally, you know, I, I need to be experiencing his love. I need to just really um appreciating and experiencing his love every day i made my living for years as an artist and so in the spring in northern minnesota as trees the deciduous trees are getting their leaves there's a color that only exists in the spring in a new leaf and when all the trees are starting to get that it's just an amazing color and so i love just looking at that and thanking god for that color of green because like you don't see it any other time of the year and it's a cool color and it's almost impossible to paint and capture and so it's like those that's one of those like really worshipful moments for me is really seeing that this time of year. And I was noticing that this morning. So it was fresh spring growth on my brain. What about you guys? What are some other kind of characteristics as we're raising up identifying worship leaders? Well, I think it's interesting that you mentioned just sort of being there yourself personally. Um what I've noticed, and I'd love to hear what Melissa and Jason would say on this, is that that is definitely a non-negotiable, but it doesn't automatically mean that you can help others get there too mm. when you lead. Um, yeah. And I mean, at least for us, I think that our highest priority is finding worship leaders that are able to do that, yeah. that are able to help people deeply engage with God. Uh, I think that we can all say that if we put a lot of effort in and our hearts are oriented right and we have the right attitude that it's glorifying to God. But I mean, I think that we as vineyard people unapologetically want more. We want to deep drink of God's presence. We want to deeply engage with him and we want the room to feel that um, we want a transcendent experience. Uh, we want to feel like we are in the arms of our heavenly father and some worship leaders do it. Some worship leaders don't. And Some worship leaders um, are super gifted and super talented, um, but yet I think that we've all had experiences, not in not in criticism of them, but we've all had experiences when we felt like that was very there was a lot of talent from the stage. Yet I just don't feel like I connected with God. Yeah, and so I mean I think that if you're looking to raise up worship leaders in your church and you're a worship leader, or if you're a church planner, um, that is the quality or the spiritual gifting that. I think when it comes to worship, at least here, we most highly prize. Yeah. So, Ted, I got a question for you on that really quick before we move on. It's like, so you can see that happening. Like, like, like we've probably many of us have seen worship leaders who, who are just playing the music or worship leaders who are really engaging people in that. How do you, how do you, um, how do you recognize that or how, what, like, what are you looking for? In, in regards to that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I have a few things that I'm looking for, but I'd love to hear from other folks on this because I don't know even, I don't know if I'm right on this, but here's the thing that I've noticed. And um, when we have a new worship leader uh, that comes up and takes the stage for the first time in a co-leading situation or whatnot, it's almost like it's super electric that first time. It's like we put them on stage and it, at least this is what I've noticed. I've noticed that they're, that it just goes incredibly, incredibly well. Like it's the first time that they're on stage in front of people and people are super engaged, you know? Um, and then the next time it stinks. And then the next time after that, 
it gets a little better, but it still stinks. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's almost like we put people on stage and, and they lead and it's like God saying, okay, I would just want to confirm that you're going to invest in this person. Um, and then they just go back to where maybe like as a newer worship leader, you might expect that they would be. So that's the first thing that I look for. If I put them on stage, is there that sense of electricity, even from the beginning? Uh, because that gives me hope that, yeah, worship leading is a craft. You can get better at it. You can keep doing it and get better at it. Um, and uh, th that just gives me like hope that if I invest in that person, we'll continue to see that. Maybe not, maybe not like right away, but we will continue to see that. That's yeah. the first thing that I look for. The second thing that I look for is I look for other people's feedback on whether or not they connected with God. So I ask my pastor, I ask other lay people that I trust um, that are sensitive to the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I say, what was that like for you? You know, how was that experience for you? And I, and I do that, you know, um, some people, it's, it's totally obvious. Every time they're on stage, something's happening. They might not sing great. They might not play great, but you're like, whoa, what just happened? You know, um, but sometimes it's not as obvious. Um, and, uh, and so I ask for other people's opinion on that too. Yeah. And, uh, and the third thing, I'm, this is the last thing that I'll say is that I give people a long leash. So I just let them lead for a long time um, before I make any evaluation of whether or not I feel like this is working at our highest level or working even at our more intermediate levels where there's not as many people. So those yeah. are the three things that I look for. That's cool, Ted. M Melissa, what about, what about for you? What are some essential characteristics in identifying or what are you thinking? Well, I have to say, I like what Ted said about long leash. You know, that's something to remember, you know, when people are young and growing in this is like giving them time to grow and mature in it. Um, but going back to kind of the start of it and kind of like picking people out, one of the, the first thing is a commitment to the church, to the Jesus, like you were saying, but a commitment to the church. So serving not only on the stage, but you want to see them serving in other areas and like Ted talks a lot about small groups and the importance of leading in small groups, which he can talk more about, but, um, or I can, uh, and just, um, other commitments, just kind of like a, an, a servant heart, you know, that needs to come first because as a worship leader, you're serving your church, you're serving your people. Your role is to serve, to lead them into God's presence, usher them in and get out of the way. Right. So that's a very, it's like, um, an usher standing at the front door, of a meeting hall or something, you're, you're welcoming people in and kind of bringing them into this place. And it's not about um, lights or sound or stage. It's about a servant role and a servant heart. Make sense? That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, commitment to the church. Uh, we also uh, ask our leaders to be committed to, um, sir, uh, to being in small groups, you know, um, and so that's another way of committing commit to the church and being in relationship and community um, within the church. So that's one of the things. That's good. Hey, Jason, just to get you in this conversation early, talk about just, uh, you know, uh, a commitment to kind of some vineyard DNA kinds of things. Like give us like, what, what are you looking for in terms of that? Well, I think there's a, you know, we like to see people that want to celebrate what their family, their tribe is doing and, and, you know, the songs that are coming out of, of, of vineyards. Um, you know, one of my board members talked about, you know, we need to do vineyard songs because those are the songs that God has given us. He's given it to the vineyard. Mm. And it's kind of a unique thing with us because we're, we're, um, very diverse, uh, in style, you know, we're, we're getting there with other, other diversities, but, you know, so we're going to have people that, um, are doing all country people that are doing modern, you know, as a style, I guess it's modern worship or whatever, but, um, you know, seeing a willingness to celebrate whatever's happening, regardless of who it is, mm -hmm. but cheering each other on, I think that's, um, needs to be part of our DNA that we support each other and love each other and are, um, have grace for each other. Um, and that, you know, with Vineyard, the worship is not just the music bit. It is an experience with God. So I think it's uh, very important that we're singing what we believe, mm. that um, 
we are representing the kingdom theology as we see it in the vineyard. Um, hmm. if, if I see someone is just singing songs from from another source exclusively, I'm thinking there's a there's a part that's missing because we have some uniqueness in the way we view the kingdom. You know, we're not triumphal. We're not. We do believe in the now and the not yet, and our songs need to reflect that. And because um, then that's what the people are singing in the congregation. And it's it's getting into their ethos and the way they pray and the way they interact with God. That's really good. I want to, when we get into the next section, I want to unpack this long leash thing a little bit more and, and kind of dive into that. But just um, what, what are there, is there anything else that we're like, as we're looking at kind of the essential characteristics of identifying young worship leaders, like anything else, what, what, what else comes to mind, you guys? There's two more for me. Um, one would be, um, are they trainable, right? So something like, are they willing to be at home and practicing their instruments and, you know, working on their vocals, whatever that is, are they, are they trainable? Are they willing to work and grow? Are, are they willing to grow? Um, that's key. And then another one is just, um, again, in this role as a worship leader, you, um, you're, it's your place for people need to trust you and feel safe with you. And so you need to be a person who's trustworthy and safe, and you need to be a person of integrity. And so just um, you need to have a relationship with Jesus, but you also need to be working on yourself as an individual to have integrity and have a good, strong character, um, first and foremost, in my opinion. Um, so a strong character. That's really yeah. good. I agree with that. And I think that there are really some practical ways that you can, you can kind of maybe force the issue for, 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 for your worship leaders. And I think one of those things is you just are ruthless about sharing the stage, Mm. sharing the platform, you know, I mean, I think that uh, our insecurity or maybe our, our whatever you know whatever two sides of that coin might be our pride or our our over reliance on our ability or our just you know fear or whatever can keep us from doing some of those things and um i think that if you can exhibit and demonstrate generosity uh as a worship leader like you are raising someone else up or you are sharing the stage with someone i mean a lot of those things start to take care of themselves you know a little bit I mean, you still have to have conversation, but at least, at least as far as I've seen, um, not hogging that platform, but being generous about it really helps. Yeah, that's good. One of the things that I, that I've looked for over the years is a love for the whole church. So, you know, not just, uh, not just a championing of, you know, what happens on stage and what's happening musically, but really a love for like the whole body of Christ, like the whole church that we're a part of. And, and I'm not talking at this point, I'm not talking about like all the other churches. I'm just talking about like the, the whole group, you know, all the different age groups and all the different ways that people interact with God, a uh, love for the word of God. And, and so I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm always looking for something that's a, a little deeper than, um, Hey, I like to play some music. And cause I don't know who doesn't like to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's interesting as as we hear from all you guys that there is a sense that that musical ability hasn't really been brought up a whole lot yet, you know. Mm-hmm. And so the 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 givens are depth in relationship and intimacy uh, with with Jesus. So so I think oftentimes that maybe isn't the first play for people as they're thinking about who's, who's going to be those people up on stage. Um, and resoundingly, we're hearing that it's, it's depth of character and depth of relationship with Jesus. Would you say that's true, Michael? I would say that that's the foundation that has to be there. And, but then if they can't play music, or like Ted said at the beginning, if they can't actually lead other people into that place of intimacy, then it's, it's not very helpful. <laughs> it's like a car with no wheels. To um, to that end, I think that uh, we want to we want to be sharing some resources along the way here, um, and folks, we we have a ton of them for you. So we're gonna shoot them out along the way, and then at the end of the session, we're also gonna give you a link to all of the resources. Um, but we have a, a really great devotional from Vineyard USA 
on uh, experiencing God, encountering God uh, in worship uh, as a little devotional, um, along with a video from Phil Strout about experiencing God. So a couple really helpful things, um, especially as you're thinking about how do we get this kind of DNA stuff in there? Uh, how do we get folks seeing what the vineyard is and, and some of the history of it? Um, we're also throwing in a, an article from John Wimber, uh, Worship uh, Intimacy with God. And so, again, three really key elements here to those essentials that um, we want to be giving you along the way. Uh, we would love to, we, we've got a bunch of new folks that have joined us. Uh, welcome to those folks who have. We've, we've said hi via the chat window. Um, and so if you're, if you haven't seen that yet, click and open your chat window. And then we have a couple questions that have come in already. And so Derek says, I wonder if you could speak to whether or not you require someone to understand that we use music to arrive at worship before you put them up on stage. Ted, what would you say to that question from Derek? Um, I'm not totally sure I understand it. Music to arrive. If someone else has ideas on that, do, what does that mean? Does that mean? I wonder if it refers to the lack of kind of talking in between songs and that sort of stuff. And Derek, feel free to to clarify if you if you could there um, about arriving kind of into worship before putting them up on stage. And he says to clarify, I get a lot of people who play music, but they don't understand that it's deeper. Mm. You know, uh, I, I would love to hear what other folks would have to say about it. I have a few thoughts. The first thought is, um, uh, and this is just, maybe this is just idiosyncratic to our church culture. Um, but I think there's the two ways of kind of understanding something, whether or not, like it's, 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 uh, it, you know, you, you can teach them, like you can have them go through a class or have them like our worship leaders, they have to take a class before they arrive on our stage. Um, and at that point, I think that what you're getting at, Derek, we try to talk about the, the value of music and, and how it's so integral to worship and, and that it's not just playing music, but we're actually taking people on a journey, um, into the, very depth of God's presence. Um, but also, I think that they've also got to experience it too. And so maybe this is just idiosyncratic for us, but we're pretty, we, we, we are pretty generous about our stage and about people who play and just, you know, um, we have gentle reminders along the way. Um, but for the most part, our hope is that as they are on stage, they can experience those things. So that's just how we do it. I'd love to hear some other thoughts on it. Yeah. You know, we, you know, I always think back to that phrase, it's caught, not taught. And there is something about that it being caught, but, but you do have to be in a surrounding where others are there for you to teach. So you can catch it. You know what I mean? Like you need to have that, um, your church environment has to be that way. So it's about kind of, um, helping your church. Right. And then a new person kind of in that swirl can, can catch it. Um, but there's also um, this kind of side by side, which I've done more recently is like a side by side route, right, where you're mentoring somebody along the way, and you're able to um, have a lot of conversations along the way about this is what we're doing and why, you know, like I mentioned that ushering in thing, it's, it's telling somebody, you know, this is our role, this is why. And, and so it's kind of like this, almost like a holding hands in a way, but it's a, it's a mentorship training role that I think can help certain folks um, to understand the bigger picture of what we're doing. Does that make sense? Um, but I also have, you know, there's also like going back to that caught, not taught. Um, my dad was uh, not a Christian. And um, when he was, I think it was high school and his uh, worship leaders and folks, they brought him into uh, the church. They needed a drummer. So they brought him in and this is not a worship leader role, but, um, they brought him into play and soon enough, you know, he, he caught it and he gave his life to Christ. And my dad is like the most worshipful drummer I've ever met in my life. And so he caught it. Does that make sense? So being around it can help people get it, but also having conversations, having them read things, all those things as well. So that's Casey's story too. You know, 
yeah. I mean, he was a musician, got pulled into a church band. And, uh, and I mean, we all know Casey and the impact and influence he has um, on us uh, when it comes to what worship looks like. But which is not to say that you should abdicate the training or the teaching and uh, the, the side by side sort of thing. But um, we found that people like the stage. And if we can leverage that somehow for mm-hmm. transformation, I mean, we'll, we'll do it. I mean, we love to leverage the platform for people's change in people's lives. And I don't know if it's the best way because sometimes it's messy and sometimes, you know, I have have to have some pretty hard conversations. Um, but the possibilities just seem really, really cool if um, if that can happen. Yeah, I agree. The mess is sometimes very well worth it because uh, of what you get at the, as a result of being able to work through difficult things as they come up. And if you, if you want no mess at all, and you want to get everything cleaned up and perfect before you put it on stage, then it's a really slow go. And I, I don't know that you get some of the really cool creativity and, and transformation that happens in our lives. Um, the, the, the messes, uh, the difficult things are uh, mostly how we grow. So... Justin, do we have some more questions out there? Or are we ready to move on to the next section here? Yeah, I think there's one really helpful question. David Boyer uh, commented, he said, um, the comment was made about, quote, vineyard music and how it should be played. And I think this would be helpful for you to just comment on, Jason. Um, he says, I didn't start in the vineyard, so I vibe with the music, but I also get inspiration from other Christian music. And his question is kind of about sort of, what maybe what is that content which you were talking about which is more uh in the content not just the style because you mentioned there's there's many different styles of those vineyard songs but it seems like vineyard music you're also saying there's something deeper in the content that is about who we are you want to comment on that yeah i think i mean it's not unique and and you know our church does other songs i think there's an element of um playing what our, our hymnity that is the vineyard. We have this rich history, but it's it's more about singing what we believe. And then style-wise, it's kind of, you know, vineyard kind of, the the days of vineyard having a style, I think, are long gone. Some people may not know that, but, you know, we're, <laughs> the style is so diverse if you look at what we do. And, and vineyard, you know, worship is not just what is – has the tag on it, you know, it's, it's hopefully people are going to be writing for their own church. And then the, those vineyard songs, the same, you know? And so that's, uh, I don't know if that answers the question as far as, I mean, if you're new to the vineyard, I encourage people to kind of read the history or learn stuff. I think that's helpful. And, um, and to be singing some of the same songs where as a group, as a tribe, we're singing, you know, we have, you know, we, in the early days, there wasn't really any other options. I mean, Vineyard kind of invented this thing. So Vineyard's just played Vineyard songs. Um, but, you know, by the 90s, and John Wimber's, you know, philosophy was give it away. That was it. He would always say, give it away. So, and I think on the worship front, we did our best to do that. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of the other modern worship folks would trace some of their roots to the Vineyard. And so then there was a lot more options. Um, so we want to sing those songs that that God is giving to this church, Big C. But we want to, um, we do want to be aware of the songs that that are coming from our own churches, and hopefully uh, reflecting the theology that we have in the Vineyard and what our current, what God is currently speaking to us. That's really good, Jason. So. Uh... Michael, as we transition a little bit, uh, it, we were, our conversation was turning this way. And so let's, let's kind of move towards mentoring and training young creatives. I feel like a lot of the questions that we've heard now is now that we have these folks in our church that are popping up with either skill or heart or leadership, um, how do we get them on a path to serving? And, you know, to Ted's language, how long or short is that leash once you're, once you're training them up? Yeah, so from my perspective, the best discipleship is always life on life and face to face. And you're always like you're you're always interacting with people. You it's 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 not, you know, the classes are good, the things that we teach in large group are great, but unless we are like 
actively doing ministry with one another the way that Jesus was with his disciples and really training them in that, then discipleship, you know, hasn't really started taking place yet. And so let's have, let's just talk about like, how, how do we do this? Like when does Sunday morning playing on that stage come up for you guys? Uh, how do you like, get somebody kind of ready for that? Um, we've talked about some of the things that we're looking for, but what kind of processes do we use to do that? And, and then if you're in a church like smaller, like a church plant or a church under hundred people, and there's not a gazillion resources there, like how do you do it in that kind of setting? So let's, let's share some things on that. Well, Melissa alluded to something that I'm pretty passionate about. And, and that is, uh, leading worship in small group. Um, I, I think that one of uh, there's this book called the power of habit and it talks about um, how to form habits, how to break habits, but it also talks about keystone habits and keystone habits are habits that were you to engage in them. They would cascade into all sorts of other kind of good behavior. Um, So for instance, uh, like eating dinner as a family together. I mean that the studies have shown that what happens when you eat, dinner together as a family is that you grades are better nutrition is better budgeting is better it's a keystone habit because lots of other good behavior results from it so sort of a long way of saying that for for at least i think us i mean we want worship leaders to lead in our small groups um and as a starting point um and as an enduring thing uh because i think you learn things when you lead uh, small group. I'm in a small group. I think you learn how to respond to the Holy Spirit. I think you learn what songs work, what songs don't work. I mean, you're forced to lead every week. And so that's one of the pathways for us. The other thing that I would say is that I think our stage nowadays is so confusing um, to people when they come in. I mean, we, we, there's a proliferation of platform and performance um, that everyone is exposed to. And uh, so if you're a guest or you're an unchurched person um, uh, or you're coming from from a tradition where there wasn't really a stage or really like, quote, a rock band. I mean, I think it's confusing because I think our ability um, as these changes have happened have also um, gotten better, too. And so what we produce on stages actually sounds pretty good a lot of times. Um, And so I think it can be confusing to the congregants as well as to the people on stage. What is this actually for? And mm-hmm. small group is is such a good antidote for that. Mm-hmm. I mean, because you are you are leading a uh, worship for a small group of people, and it's not about platform. It's not about stage. It's not about the the high morale that can come from being recognized from other people, no matter how large or small your church may be. And so, for us, small group is one of that step. That's part of that long leash. Uh, we have smaller venues then that we invite people to. Um, and then we have our stage, you know, for our main services. And that is um, that is also very slow, too. It's a song. And then maybe it's two songs. And then maybe it's two songs for a while, you know, hmm. um, until they uh, demonstrate maybe some ability, at, you know, um, and some comfortability with leading a band. Um, and then when those things happen, then we try it them leading a band but we never give titles and we never um uh never like say you know this is your band now you know we just like are very careful one of the ways that we have a long leash is that we're very careful to just kind of keep the responsibility um a little bit more restrained as time goes on and just see how people do at each step you know it's good for us and it's good for them because there honestly there's a lot of risk mitigation <laughs> that happens on a Sunday. Sometimes you're on, you have people on stage and you're like, I don't know what is happening. I mean, it happens here for us. And when that happens, I usually have a conversation with my lead pastor about it. Uh, and it's not terribly pleasant, you know? Um, so, I mean, it's, there's a lot of risk mitigation, but even in smaller churches, it's that way too. I mean, there's a lot at stake, you know, people are coming to, make a decision on whether they want to be a part of your community or they're coming to as a first impression. And man, yeah. if we can back that up as far as possible by just saying, Hey, we are so committed to small group worship here um, that we want you leading in small group worship. In fact, we say to our worship leaders, we'd rather have you leading in our small group worship in, in a small group than on stage. So if it can't be one or the other, then it's going to be small group. Yeah. 
That's great. And then Melissa, do you want to talk for a minute about how in that process of leading in small groups that we're working on character development? Because Christopher Meekins brought up a really good question about how do we help godly character, growth in godly character, keep pace with growth in skill and development and musical ability? Yeah, well, you know, it's like, um, it's being in that smaller group, that smaller community, you're in community. So if you think iron sharpens iron, you know, mm-hmm. like you're, you're rubbing edges with these people that you are hopefully in community with, and you are talking about life with, you're sharing life with, you know, and it, it does help like kind of take those edges and maybe dull those edges, you know, and, and help you kind of shape it, you know? And so I think the small group thing is very important. Um, the the thing is like we're at a small church right we're about to hit our second year as a as a church plant so i don't know if we're church plant anymore but um smaller church so there is like um fewer uh, opportunities for um platform we have one platform one service so that um kind of like that that those steps you know that pathway to the main stage is a little bit different so it's small groups but then you have to go Okay, you also need to help them with their um, their band development and their leadership development, you know. So to me, that is, um, you know, we have young adults group, things like that, that, that they can lead in. But then it's that side-by-side thing. Again, going back to, I think, ironing, sharpening, ironing, bring people alongside you. And like Ted was saying, you, you give them a song or you just have them alongside you for a while. And that's it. Just seeing how a band works, you know, kind of learning those things. Um, and and developing developing that way but there is a point where it just could get a little messy you know in a small church because where else can they learn you know and yeah. like you were saying earlier to when you grow you have to you have to trip and fall you have to fail you have to you have to learn from those things so it might be a little bit messy in a smaller setting but worth the risk you know yeah very much so jason talk for a little bit like we were talking earlier and you brought up some of the questions that uh, John Wimber would ask John Barnett, who I think is on this webinar. So you got to get the questions right that he was asked, but <laughs> talk for a minute about that. Yeah. John can correct me. This is just one of many stories, you know, but that I think is a great model that, that Wimber did, you know, John, John and Marie have been around in the vineyard for a really long time. Many of you know them um, and are still, uh, married and loving Jesus after a long, long time, which is is what we want. Um, but you know, John would talk about like when he would encounter Wimber. Hopefully, everyone—I don't know if everyone here knows who Wimber is—but he was basically the founder of the Vineyard. And but John's comments to him were always asking about how is Marie, how are the kids, how's it, how's your marriage? You know, it's um, the concern was always with John's family and soul. If I hope I'm speaking correctly since John is listening, but I think it's a great story that, that we, um, that is our concern, not like what songs are you writing and you know, what new, whatever, but there was always just a concern for the soul. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Cause that's the, that's where all this flows from, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's where it all that, comes from. That, just that, what you say flow there, I think it's Annabeth Morgan that always says that she, you know, leading from a place of overflow which yeah. goes back to that, like, are you, you know, is this something that you're, you know, are we encouraging our leaders to be reading and devouring time with Jesus in their personal life, you know, in the, during the week um, so that when they lead, it's, uh, I think maybe she's talking about ministry, but even leading from a place of overflow. Yeah. I had a, a, a guy who was a mentor of mine for about a year. He was an Episcopal uh, priest, and he used to say that uh, service, what we do, is the overflow of a life spent in the presence of God. And uh, I always love that. That was just a great line for me. So, Michael, talk a little bit um, and and kind of shift our conversation here. Um, we we've heard a lot about the worship leader themselves, but what about the senior pastors who are often mentoring and often the one bringing them up? Um, Maybe somebody who, like you, has had a worship background, and maybe somebody who uh, is a senior leader but hasn't had sort of the musical uh, worship leading background. 
Yeah, so I've talked to a lot of uh, church planters or senior pastors who don't have a musical background, and they can feel really intimidated because they they don't have that and they don't speak uh, musical language. I'm I, I'm a drummer, so I'm not quite sure if I speak musical language or not. <laughs> Good see drummer joke like that, and uh, but I I think it's in I've heard over the years, and as senior pastors, I think you hear this about everything in the church. Like if you want the one aspect of the church to grow, you as a senior pastor have to be engaged in it. And, and I, in, in, in one sense, as a senior leader, that gets really annoying because it seems like you have to do everything. But in another sense, it's really true. Like if you're not really engaged in worship, uh, I've, we've often heard it said that the senior pastor is the main worship leader. It's the person who's actually going to drive this thing forward. That the value is going to flow from uh, the the main leaders, and so you know. And so I just think that's true. This is something that we have to be engaged in. It's something that's got to be a part of of our lives. And uh, uh, Ted, you had some really good thoughts on senior pastors who might be intimidated and not feel very creative or not feel like they could speak to worship leaders. I'd love to hear you rant on that for a minute. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I, I I think it should be said that senior leaders are some of the most creative people in church. I mean, uh, I think that sometimes senior leaders are often tabbed as non-creatives uh, because they might not uh, be um, an artist like Michael, or they might not have led worship. Um, but honestly, uh, it's demanding coming up with a message every week. You know, and in the process of of raising a new church plant to life, um, that's a creative act. That's incredibly creative. You know, um, it's creative because you're calling new life out of people as you employ them in the ministry. It's creative because you have to make new cultural artifact rhythms for your for your church life. It's just it's so creative. And so the one thing that I would say is I would just say to the senior leaders on this call or any church planner that ends up hearing this is just to affirm you as a creative person and that the conversation that you have with your worship leader um, is a conversation on level ground, even if the vocabulary needs to be uh, codified or translated sometimes. And, um, and so I oftentimes think uh, that, that um, what puts uh, that relationship sometimes at odds is maybe not, an under, not a, a lack of understanding on the part of the senior leader that they are creative, mm -hmm. or maybe a lack of understanding on a worship leader that, that hey, this person is actually engaged in an intensely creative act, trying to come up with illustrations and analogies, trying to come up with a narrative for these important, important, important truths. And so um, what we found here in the Northeast and I don't know if this is true out of out of uh, everywhere um, in the states when it comes to vineyard churches, um, is that the senior leader is really the most engaged coach when it comes to the worship leader. Um, they they are the ones that are oftentimes giving the feedback from week to week. They are the ones who are adjusting. They are the ones who like when they see a song go up on screen, and you're like, "What was that?" They are saying something about it, you know, um, but I think the difficult thing is because of this posture of maybe I'm a non-creative. Um, uh, there is not conversation at the front end. And uh, and so one thing that I would say or suggest, I mean, I'm not a senior leader myself. Um, so I, I'm, I, I I say this with a lot of trepidation and, and hopefully a lot of humility is just have the conversation on the front end about what it looks like to build the architecture of your service so that it will usher people into the presence of God and have that conversation in collaboration with your worship leader and just know that you're on level ground. You know, you're not, you're not less creative, um, even though your worship leader might be like writing hundreds of songs and, and at the spoken word thing at the local bookstore every week, you know, I mean, you're not less creative, you know, you're just different. And, uh, and so oftentimes I think that the conversation can be strained, even though they're great conversation can happen, but I think that oftentimes it can be strained just because of those differences, not because of a deficit in creativity. I get, I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's really good. Very helpful. 
I think I think it makes a lot of sense to to Josh Ray who says boom. I think that was a mic drop that with that comment there, Ted. That was tremendous. Uh, and we've had a couple other folks kind of asking a few questions along the way. Um, and one that that we that we hear often in the vineyard is this phrase of everybody gets to play. And so um, you commented a little bit on this on Ted about small group, but Matt Greco says talk about having quote non Christians, so folks who don't have a background. Um, in the church, folks who have, you know, maybe even just come into the church, how do you, how can you use that as a kind of a, an avenue to get them um, involved and not discouraged from the church because they don't have that background, right? Because they don't have all the presuppositions and assumptions. Um, what are ways that you've also welcomed folks into the church through that vehicle of worship? Well, I, I'm talking a lot. I'll say this and it'll be really quick. I promise. Um, I am not going to set a super high bar in terms of what, it com- what, what a person is in terms of their level of faith or in terms of even where they are. I mean, we put explorers, we put people that just weren't even sure whether or not being in church was worthwhile. We put them on stage because we want them to catch uh, catch that value that there's something actually deeper and more incredible and powerful happening when we sing. I mean, like we sometimes say on the weekend services, this is more than music guys. So we want to invite you to have expectation and man, I just think it's so, so good, uh, that, that, that people's appetites are wedded on that no matter where they're at in their spiritual journey. Um, so I'm not that concerned because I feel like once you get them hooked on the presence of God, it's easy to start having some of the other conversations, you know, I mean, it's still hard, but, but, but it becomes easier because they're like, yeah, there's something worthwhile. There's something different. There's something that fills me in a way that nothing else has. And I want, I want to have continued conversation about it. So don't have too high strictures. I don't have too high strictures myself. I don't know if that's the case for you guys. Um, Melissa over at Fullerton. Uh, personal experience for me, I remember being involved in a vineyard church as a drummer. I think as I just reflecting back, I think it was the fourth church plant and it was the second vineyard I was involved in musically. And uh, uh, I, I remember doubting on the way Sunday morning, going to worship practice pretty much every single week thinking, is this real? <laughs> like, are, are we just making this stuff up or... Like, is this real? There's a really good lot of arguments about not, they're not being a God, you know? And I'd get there and I'd go up to the worship leader and I'd go, so I was sick on the way in this morning. Is this stuff real? <laughs> you know? And like, he'd get together and like coach and counsel and pray with me and like, here, I'm still doing it. And you know what? I 100% believe it's real. <laughs> but it's like, if he, if he would have just said, oh man, this guy's got some doubts. I'm kicking him off the team. Like, I, I, I don't think I'd be right here today. I hear crickets. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, what do you think about We're it? We're all looking at Casey's comment. Right, it's oh. true. Well, I, I mentioned that same thing, speaking of drummers, about my dad, you know. Uh, he had the same thing. It was He wasn't a believer, and then he entered in. I think the other thing um, that I'm – is being in community with a bunch of other so say that they don't know you know and and we're a small church so if we had somebody who was not a believer want to be on the worship team there there are avenues for us um we we just we have a um a very large we have very large group of creatives in our church so it's a little bit different for us we've got a lot of people so I, I, we would, um, have them in small groups, have people in small groups. You don't have to be like at some senior level pastor though, you know, of believe, believing, you know, but, um, they need to be in small groups and all those things. But I think that there's, um, um, this idea of community surrounding yourself in this community of people that are believers and are going this direction and being in that, um, I think helps people go, okay, there's something here. So I'm just going to dive in and, and choose to go with it. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? If you're surrounded in it. And um, uh, there was one more thing I had about community. And I think that was it. Yeah. Community. 
So, Melissa, uh, on the topic of community, um, maybe talk a little bit about worship leader retreats. You know, as we kind of switch a little bit here to being practical, our next sessions uh, section is really going to just be talking about some practical needs. Um, what does Vineyard Worship offer as far as the worship leader retreats? What are those and how could one be a part of them if they're seeking that kind of community? Well, um, we have our website, which all our events are listed um, there. We've got these worship leader retreats, which are a great place to come. It's a place of community, a place of um, of transformation. Really, people come, they engage with the Lord, and there's a transformation that happens, I believe, to every person um, that attends. You know, you've got relationships that are made, but you've got this um, uh, just this time with the Lord, um, this engagement with the Lord that can that can change things. It's it's a game changer for a lot of people. So we have those on our website. We've got them all over the country, and we are building more um, more opportunity for those as well. That's wonderful. And I just sent over that link uh, in the chat. So if you want to check out if there's if there's a worship leader retreat coming in your area, um, just click there on that link and and dive forward. Um, welcome, Matt Giorgiano, who says greetings, and uh, and Danielle says synergy abounds at these worship retreats. Uh, so a good testimony there. And yeah. just one those, note, uh, those on retreats, account- um, just if for the senior leaders that are on here, um, you know, um, to send your worship leaders there um, is a key training ground, especially if they're new to the vineyard or new to leading worship. That is a place where things get caught and taught. <laughs> But, um, it, and then the community element of it, there's just a, um, it's really sweet in the vineyard when we all get together. And, and so can't encourage, I know a lot of people here have been to them so they can testify that if you haven't been or you have a worship leader who hasn't been, try to, try to get them there. Yeah, as a senior pastor, it's one of the best things you can do is send your worship leaders to one of these retreats. We've been sending ours for years. And it was awesome because when uh, he would come back, like for the whole next month, worship was like at a whole new level. It's like it would just step up after the retreat. And, you know, it just happened year after year after year. And it's just absolutely brilliant watching the stuff that you get from being around people who have been there and done that and getting poured into their lives. So uh, it, it, couldn't be, uh, it couldn't be more brilliant. It's a great thing you guys have done creating those. One, one more thing as we transition from kind of mentoring young adults and young leaders, um, Lori Pickett says, uh, I'm an actual testimonial of allowing a non-Christian to be on a worship team. When I first came into the kingdom, I didn't even know what a worship team was or any of the songs, but singing was something I felt like I could do and wanted to get involved. Uh, mm-hmm. Lori, thank you so much for letting uh, the vineyard welcome you, letting Jesus meet you in that um, during your time. And I think that's so, so good. Um, so thanks for that. Thanks for being honest about that. Uh, we got a bunch of questions that are coming in that just kind of key in on some practical stuff. And uh, we have some uh, resources to send along. So I'm going to send along those resources. And one to maybe kick us off would be um, there's, a, there's a worship leader set critique form uh, that Ted kind of has been a part of developing. Um, Ted, as you think about the practical needs, how has that been a tool that's, that's really been helpful? Well, first of all, shout out to Matt, Matt Turgiano, because this was something that he and I developed together. I mean, I think actually he did most of the work, which would not be surprising. Uh, if you know Matt, he, he's a hard charger like that. Um, but I just think it's helpful uh, just to say a couple things about it. Um, I think it's helpful to quantify as much as you're able to uh, what what it means for worship to go well. Um, because I think that that can become so, uh, just beca- can become so hard to actually figure out, believe it or not. So, um, I mean, like, I, I, I don't know if you guys have heard of this before. Um, there's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And, hmm. and so basically what the Dunning-Kruger effect is, is, it's uh, these are two scholars from Cornell University. What they discovered is they discovered that the more inept you are at something, the harder it is for you to figure out that you're actually inept at it. The smarter you think you are, <laughs> the more inept you are, um, the better you think you're doing. They would test students that would regularly fail and say, "Well, how did you do?" And they would always say that they did like eighty percent. You know, um, and I'm not saying that 
church planters or worship leaders are subject to the Dunning-Kruger effect necessarily. But I spent five years church planning in California. We could not understand why we were growing and our worship and our preaching was a problem. We just did not, we just weren't aware of it. You know, we thought everything is great. It's not what we're presenting, you know, because we're awesome. We're amazing. You know, um, I don't know if this is true or not, but at least from an anecdotal perspective, it seems like a lot of times when you're, 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 you're planting or when you're starting something, you, you, you can, when you're highly engaged in the creative stuff, um, oftentimes shy away from the hard work of evaluating it. And, uh, and so the set critique tool is just a vehicle for, for quantifying, I guess, um, putting some really, really like tight measurements to some things um, that would make you actually um, go, okay, maybe it didn't go as well as I thought it did. Just to kind of get you out of that sometimes haze that you're in. Hey, I don't really feel like we're growing or, you know, and as a bonus, as a senior leader, I don't really even know how to coach my worship leader. I mean, if you took that critique tool and just said, hey, this is a critique tool mm-hmm. that yeah. some of our churches have used, uh, vineyard churches have used, you know, we're going to just go through that together every once in a while. Um, all of a sudden you have, you're equipped as a senior leader to talk to your worship leader about how the set was, especially if you feel like there's, there are problems, you know, but even if you don't feel like there are problems, there's always that danger of not being aware or not having perspective that what is actually happening might not be as good as you think it might be. Um, and, uh, and, and just putting measurable things to, to, um, these things that seem so mystical and so wonderful and so intimate can oftentimes help you figure out. Did that actually go well or not? So that's good. Yeah, you need you need some good evaluative tools to do that. I, I love the old line that uh, pretty much every every church planter who who comes in and says, "Man, this is not going well," but our preaching and our worship is great. Generally, it's the preaching and the worship that's the issue, and so <laughs> I, I, it's it's uh, it's one hundred one hundred percent true most of the time. <laughs> Michael, uh, Josh Hopping asked a question here. It says, yeah. is there a difference between a worship leader for a church plant versus an established, established church? Uh, as in, besides for heart of worship, uh, what else would a church planter look for uh, in a worship leader that will help launch the new church? So what have you seen for young churches, church plants kind of starting off uh, in the needs for, for a church planter that also has a worship leader? Well, one of the things that's cool is that as a church plant starts off, like in a small group, uh, you don't need to have the same um, ability in terms of quality of, of skill um, to lead. So if you're leading a group of 10 to 15 people, you don't need the same skill level that if you're leading a group of 500 people. And, and so uh, your worship leader can have the opportunity to kind of grow with the size of what you're doing. One of the main things that, I, that I'm looking for, if I'm going to plant a church and I want to bring a worship leader with me, I want somebody who can really connect one-on-one with people because so much of church plant work is just connecting one-on-one with folks. Like if your main strength is from a stage in front of a big group of people, but one-on-one you're kind of like hard to relate to and really socially awkward, then in a church plant setting, that's just not going to work very good. Where in an established church, that might be fine. Um, so th- th- those are a couple of my thoughts. Anybody else add anything else to that? I think that's great. Uh, I, I have, uh, David Stout asked, uh, earlier talking just kind of about the difference between acoustic worship and electric and, and if so, kind of what are the, the dynamics and thinking about in a quieter worship setting? Um, Jason, how do you think about the difference in, in acoustic versus electric, electric? So a very practical question, but kind of the needs for any given service or any given environment. Um, I, I don't know that I really think about it. I, I think they can both be the same. You know, we, when our church started, we didn't even have a PA. So um, it was literally acoustic. Um, and with you know no amplification, so it was, but it was cool because it brought us together. So I think, I think you can evaluate as you go along. Like, um, you know, you might be going electric for a long time, then you realize people are kind of just observing or so, observing or something. So you might do, you know, like, hey, let's break it down and 
you know, more family kumbaya vibe and and um, so that everyone's engaging in worship. I don't know. Melissa, do you have thoughts on that? No, I think that's good. That's what we do. We do we do a bit of both. We try to mix it up. We try to add in um, acoustic sets just to mix it up and, and to bring, you know, like just shift things and also to change the dynamics so there's not kind of like this expectation of the same thing week to week, you know, mix it up. And, and um, one thing we're going to try to do is like Dan Wilt does a worship circle, right? And so it'll be kind of like the the musicians at the center and just voices it's not amplified and then you kind of build your people around it and it's just made up of voices together as one and it's a really cool thing if you want more info info on it we can talk to you about it or dan can send info but uh it's just another kind of creative way to um think about worship you know Melissa, why don't you talk for a minute about um in a smaller setting building relationship with other vineyard churches that are nearby yeah, so we're in Southern California, and there's a lot of a lot of churches um, all around, which is awesome. But um, when we when I was on the worship task force, one of the things we realized is that there's a lot that you know, especially in Southern California, um, you kind of get home from work and you just you've been driving a lot or you're in traffic and you just kind of don't go out, so you kind of um, shut yourself in a little bit. And so it's real, and with how bad traffic is here, you know, it's real easy to become an island, especially as a church or as worship leaders. Mm -hmm. So we, we were trying to, we realized that our people in our area need to be connected, you know, more and just realize that there, there is a community outside of your own community and a way to kind of, um, like now to share resources. So if you're a smaller church, you know, and you need some, especially church plants, we've got some. Uh, church plants younger than ours that um, because of the community that that has been built around our area, they reach out and they say, hey, we need, you know, we need a drummer or we need this. And and churches that have more resources can often share. Um, so we have a lot of that happening in our area. And it's really helpful, um, especially to young churches. We had that. We had a lot of musicians at ours, but we still used people because we needed people in the beginning, you know, as we were growing. That's great. So, Michael, one uh, one resource that we're just going to send along is Leading Worship in the Vineyard by Dan Wilt. Uh, Dan Wilt's name was just mentioned a little bit ago. Um, Michael, I know you've seen that and spent some time with that resource. Maybe just kind of give some comments for folks who uh, might want that to get a, get a full sense of leading in the vineyard. Yeah, that's a really good practical resource that I think Dan originally wrote for uh, Vineyard Churches in the UK um, as, as almost a, a worship leading manual of sorts. And, uh, and I just think I'm glad that we're making that available because it's a really good, very practical resource that addresses lots of issues in worship leading, as well as kind of who the vineyard is and, and the DNA of uh, what we've got and what we're trying to do. So, yeah, that's a, a PDF that you can download, take a look at. I, I think it's a really kind of helpful tool, uh, especially if you're kind of bringing people along and educating them um, just about kind of who our tribe is and and how it is that we're doing some stuff. Thank you. And, and Jason, you just sent along one and then the other uh, vineyardsongs.com. Why don't you just mention a couple of those resources that we have just to really give folks some content. Okay. We, we are uh, doing some boot camps uh, for younger leaders generally. Um, I'm not, we're not directly involved, but uh, Michael Bryan and some of the folks in the Southeast are doing a boot camp. It's a uh, SE worship bootcamp.com and that's going to be in nashville and there's discount codes for church planters and that's like an intensive i think it's three or four days um and then we do uh we're going to have a boot camp here in anaheim uh in july so these will be kind of intensives um and then um well melissa could talk about the song summit that we do but there is for if you're a new church or and you have a new worship leader who's new you know just looking to get resources, we have vineyardsongs.com. So that started as a partnership between us, the U.S. and the U.K., and now Canada's come on in. So um, we kind of have a new song of the month, and we give a free MP3 um, download or however, and there's a video, but chord charts. We try to get translations. If you're doing um, – we try to get Spanish, Portuguese, and French. Hmm. Um, and if there's any others here who – 
translate into other languages, we would add the, those as well. Um, but we're hoping that's a resource that people can use and and see and you know use it to see what other people are playing or what we feel strongly about at the moment. Lisa, do you want to talk about the song summit? Uh, yeah, one thing we just started um, last year, which was really successful, was um, song summits, which are these uh, songwriting intensives for like newer younger songwriters or any songwriter who just wants um, intense training on songwriting and songwriting in the vineyard. So uh, we will have one of those. Um, they kind of um, tap onto the beginning of each of our retreats. So there's one in North Carolina in September, one in the Northeast in New Hampshire. I'm very excited. It's our first year there in the Song Summit. Um, that'll be um, actually on Halloween. So come hang out. <laughs> and uh, then in February, attached to our uh, worship leader retreat in Oregon. So we're starting those as well. And those are a great resource if you're a songwriter and you want to learn more, grow more, and um, songwrite for your vineyard church. So then I could, Halloween, I could wear my costume, I could Captain America costume for that. I could. Totally. Yeah, yeah sweet. <laughs> totally. Awesome. <laughs> hey, I, I saw something that Derek had stuck up on the uh, chat. He said, uh, in terms of working with other vineyard churches, it's been particularly difficult because we're 120 miles from the nearest vineyard. And I just kind of wanted to chime in on that for a second, because we were about 160 miles from the nearest vineyard. And as I was really praying that through in our early years, I felt like God really specifically told me, um, don't recruit anybody from the outside. Don't like bring in special guests to try to make the worship better. You just be really faithful with the little bit that you have and let me grow that. And um, so it started out with me on my old ovation and my wife helping me sing in key. And then we grew it from there. I was able to lead a drummer to Christ who had had a lot of touring experience. His life was messed up, but oh my gosh, he was a great drummer. And so we started working with him and discipling him. And that was like an extra, you know, half day meeting a week. And then we had a high school gal that played cello. And then we led another guy. I'll never forget. I, this guy met me at uh, Red Lobster and introduced him to Jesus. And I left my really nice sunglasses. My father-in-law had bought me there and I lost them that day. But I picked up a really sweet bass player who could play anything by ear after hearing it once. And so just really slowly over time, um, I felt like my focus was only supposed to be on the people that God was bringing into my life. And he would help us build a decent worship team. And um, finally, thankfully, I replaced myself and the worship got way better. And so, um, but so that's another, you know, a take at that very same thing, Derek. And uh, I think so, so, so for me, so much of this is um, not necessarily trying to copy what other people have done in their church plant settings but really listening to the Holy Spirit, following God's lead and doing what he specifically tells you to do. And then you watch what other people are doing that you can get a lot of ideas from that, but we can't really copy it at all. So just following the Holy Spirit's lead is just a huge giant thing for me in that. So that was great. I'm glad you brought that up, Derek. Thanks, Michael. Uh, we would love to just open it up if there's any other questions that folks have. Um, and as we're doing that, I'm just going to mention a couple different uh, things coming up. So um, we, have a, we have a webinar next week. This kind of jumps on the back of uh, what was just said about small uh, uh, being sort of away from other vineyards. Uh, we have a, a webinar next week on missional outreach in small towns uh, that Luke Garrity from uh, the Trinity Christian Fellowship Vineyard in, in Stanley, Wisconsin. He's going to be a part of leading that. And that's an evening one. So we'd love to have you there, uh, especially if you're somebody who kind of is in a small town setting. Um, also, they have a big conference coming up in Lancaster, Ohio, uh, at the middle of middle to end of May, the 19th through the 21st, Small Town USA Planting and Doing, doing Church Conference. Uh, it's going to be really good. Michael, I know you've worked with those guys a lot. Uh, why, why should folks in small towns think about attending this? Well, to interact with other people who are church planting and doing what we're doing in small towns is incredibly beneficial. 
Uh, Duluth itself is not considered a small town. We're like up near 80, 90,000 people, but we were starting to send out church plants into small towns. So a couple of years ago, I just showed up at the first one that they did. And I couldn't believe how encouraging it was to see what you could build in anything, you know, in terms of a really healthy church in any size town. And there were a couple of people there like Luke, he's in a town of 1700 people. And uh, and then Lancaster is a town of about 30,000. And so anything in, in there, like we, we have some really good, healthy vineyard churches. And we tend to use excuses a lot when things aren't going well, like, well, my town's just really small. And then you meet some of these men and women and you think, wow, if my town's got more than five people in it, like I could be doing some cool stuff. So it's, it's, it's fun to get to hang out with them. Thanks, Michael. Uh, and also, we want to just point out that in November, uh, the Vineyard National Ethnic Diversity Conference, Better Together, Race, Reconciliation, and the Multi-Ethnic Vineyard Church is happening in Evanston, Illinois. So uh, get that on your calendar now. Uh, that is something that we just want to continue to make sure people know about. And um, the folks running that are tremendous. Uh, Michael and I are going to be driving from Duluth down to Chicago for that one. Um, and we know there's going to be folks all over there. Um, so we can't promote that enough. Uh, so thanks everybody for being here. We haven't had too many other questions come in. Um, the lastly, I'll just say we have a, a free resource that Vineyard Worship is offering 10 free songs via MP3 and all the chord charts. So that, uh, I, I sent over a little bit ago via the, the chat. And then if you are looking for all the resources, cause we've been shooting them at you the whole time, uh, they are right there. There is the Google drive folder. Um, we're recording this now. We're going to provide this to anybody who couldn't attend. Uh, and it'll be on the Multiply Vineyard blog next week, and you'll have all these links as well. If you had uh, a good experience and you thought, wow, all that stuff that Ted said was really awesome, and you want to get other people to, to hear it, uh, remind them, tell them to go to the blog, uh, and we can't wait for you to join for any of these other webinars we have. We have one next week again uh, with our small town folks, uh, and we just hope we're, this is a good resource to help serve you. Uh, Melissa and Jason, thanks you guys for, for joining us from Southern California. It's been great having you here. Thanks. Thanks for having us. That's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, Ted from all the way, uh, out on the East coast, we really appreciate all the wisdom you're giving to us. Thanks for having me on. It was a blast. And go Cubs, right? Go Cubs. <laughs> uh, well, Michael, could you, uh, could you just pray for us as we close? Yes. Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, each of the folks that uh, were helping to lead this and then everyone who participated. And Lord, my prayer is that you would help us to uh, be incredible worshipers of you, that we would be people after your own heart, and that you would uh, anoint us and equip us to lead the churches uh, that we have the privilege of being a part of, to lead them well in worship of you. And I ask that you would make us really great at training and equipping uh, generation after generation of people uh, to be able to do that as well. And we just say thank you. Thank you for the gift that worship is, the way it reorients our lives. Thank you for the gift of music and sound and especially rhythm. <laughs> And thank you for just our family and our tribe and the relationships that we have with one another. We just say you're a good, good father. In Christ's name, amen. Well, blessings, folks. Thank you again, and we'll see you soon.